The Arch Advocate Show is shining the burning fire of truth in these dark times. Approaching this reality with pragmatic spirituality. And calling out the father of lies and his minions with the spirit of the word of God. His majesty, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, getting into the immigrant crisis. <laughs> what can be said about this? We just saw President Obama going on television and in front of a, a group of, um, I'm assuming, 200 people, literally tens of people, uh, going up and saying, oh, there's a, uh, Donald Trump is attacking these poor refugees that are come, come, coming up from, uh, you know, Honduras and Guatemala. These poor refugees, quote, refugees. And, uh, you know, that, that word... That word. You guys know I'm a word snob now. As a matter of fact, if you guys want to send me a Christmas present, I need a dictionary. I need an old school, like, preferably one published before 1990, right? Uh, an old one. I need a dictionary because when I was growing up, uh, I'm assuming, just like most of you, when you went to your mom and said, hey, what does this word mean? She would say, well, go look it up. And then it was like this fun treasure hunt right you had to go get in the book and you had to go through all the words you had to follow the alphabet and then the, then the second letter of the alphabet and it was you know it was in order according to the the sequence of letters that made up that word <clears throat> that's why i'm a word stop like there's there's a lot of people in the world that didn't grow up that way and if they don't know the meaning of a word they'll use it anyways They'll use it out of place, out of context, inappropriately. It's weird. Uh, I have a I have a friend. Uh, he's actually, if you guys watch, um, if you guys watch television in America, you may notice um, there's a there's a, a a commercial that comes on for the men's warehouse, right? <clears throat> uh, what, what what's the slogan at the end? I mean, before he says, "I guarantee it." Something, 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 I guarantee it. I actually met that guy in a Las Vegas airport. Believe it or not, that guy stands like six foot five. He's huge. But anyways, if you watch the men's warehouse commercials, the new ones, the ones that are on right now, you'll see in the background there's a tailor. There's a guy who's tailoring the suits. I actually know that guy. He's a friend of mine. <clears throat> His name is Sean. But uh, wow, why did, why did I start talking about that? Oh, I remember. So... Uh, one time, Sean and I were hanging out, and I kept telling him about uh, how much I appreciated the magazine Cigar Aficionado. However, at that time, I was mispronouncing aficionado, and I can't, I don't even remember how it was that I was mispronouncing it. And he is actually, uh, he was an English major in college, and so he stopped me and corrected me. And he said, no, it's actually pronounced this way. I said, oh, okay, so I, you know, I corrected my ways. And the thing about, you know, mis the misuse of words is that, like, if you see somebody misusing a word, like, it's actually good to correct them because the fact that they're misusing it, uh, or not misusing it, but mispronouncing it, it means that they read that word and they don't know how to pronounce it, but at least they were reading. And you want to encourage that, like, keep reading. It's all right if you mispronounce words. It's all right if you don't understand what these things are, what they mean. What isn't all right is if you don't do your research, like if you don't take correction when it comes, right? My buddy Sean, who was in the, uh, you know, the uh, men's warehouse commercials, he, uh, he corrected me and I've never made that mistake again. The meanings of words is what I'm getting at. Now, that word refugee, it has a very specific meaning. As a matter of fact, the meaning itself is so profound that there are not only laws in the United States about that word, but there are global laws about that word. And if somebody is deemed a refugee, <clears throat> we, have a, we have an entire global legal network of people who go to work every day. <clears throat> and their whole thing is to provide legal services to people who are refugees. And the word refugee, it means something very different than migrant, right? It means something very different from any other word that you can, that, that you can misuse in that. Like, whenever you see a word that is, is spelled differently, 
it means it means something different. And you should probably look it up. So here's President Obama saying like, oh, Donald Trump, he's scared of these, these poor, and he says that, these poor refugees, these poor refugees. Oh, how unchristian. Of that rotten Donald Trump mistreating these refugees because he knows that when you use that word, when people hear that word, they're like, oh, refugee, I kind of know what that means. That means that you're in a war and people are trying to kill you and you're trying to escape being put to death. Like people who are trying to escape the Soviet Union or Mao's China or Laos or Cambodia. Those are refugees, man. We have to help them. In fact, it, it is so uh, buried into Christian civilization that it's like, no, we made, we made modern day laws regarding this, regarding the treatment of refugees and where we get those laws from. It's from the Bible. That Bible that the leftists hate so much. It's like, you know, when you use that word refugee, like what you're implying, how you, how you are demanding that we respond to these quote refugees you're invoking the word of god do you understand that yeah i don't well they don't understand it but anyways the fact is is that these people coming up from the south they don't fit that they they do not fit within the definition of the word refugee and uh e even though they are migrating they are not immigrants because immigrant and migrate, <laughs> migrating means to move, right? And that's certainly what they're doing. But once you once you show up to a border where there's there's a there's uh, an invisible wall that says you can't come across this, you can't cross this unless we know who you are. You can't come into my house unless I know who you are. And if I don't like you, if I don't trust you, if I don't know you, you can't come in. So uh, at, at that point, when they start crossing that, uh, that invisible wall, it's like, well, now you're, not, you're, you're neither a refugee, nor an asylum seeker, nor a migrant. You are an invader. You're invading my property. Just like, you know, if it, even if I do know you, if I come home one day and you're in my house and I didn't invite you, like, you're no longer my friend. You're an invader. You're an intruder, right? And those words, they all have very different meanings. It's like, it's like if somebody came to you one day and said, hey, man, did you hear about old Bob? Man, he murdered a guy <clears throat> last night. And you would say, oh, my God, Bob, why did Bob murder a guy? Well, it turns out like he was just sitting at home reading his Bible to his, to his kids. Somebody came into his house and demanded that uh, he be given food and money. So he shot him. It's like, well, wait a minute. You said murdered. That's not murder. That's different. And we know that it's different because we have a completely different set of laws for those different kinds of circumstances. Well, you know, the Bible says thou shalt not kill. It's like, mm, well, it's not exactly what it says. Not exactly. And getting into, getting into the, the, the pragmatic spiritual approach to all this, it's like, look, when you do that, I told you guys this before, I went to, I was so angered by the news that I was hearing in America just three years ago. I was hearing like, there's all these refugees, man, Syrian refugees. <clears throat> these are people that before the war in Syria, they were doctors, they were engineers, lawyers, laborers. They're just good salt of the earth kind of folk. And then there's a war in Syria, and so all these people had to leave, and they are, by definition of the law, they are refugees. And they're going to England, and they're going to, to Germany, and they're going to all these places, and they're, man, they're being horribly treated, and they're not being let in. And I thought, well, this will not do. We have laws. We are Christian people. We can't be, we can't be letting these people just, you know, be, be kicked out of their home when they're just trying to save their own lives. Right? They're just trying to get to Germany, you're trying to get to Italy, you're trying to get to wherever, just so that they can live and their kids can live. This will not do. And the fact that more Christian American people are not angered and outraged by this could can only be there can only be one cause. 
and, and it can only be because they have not yet heard. So you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna buy this here GoPro, and a laptop, and an audio recorder, and a, you know a bunch of other gear, and I'm gonna go. I'm going to go get the story, and I'm going to submit it to the American people, particularly the Christian people. I'm gonna fix this, man. I will not stand for this injustice. I don't have a lot of money. I don't have, you know, but what I do have is a voice. I can go and get these people's story and I can tell their story. I'm good at storytelling. I'll go tell these people's story. And then I bought a plane ticket. I flew to London and then I went south down to, uh, down to Dover. And I got on the little ferry there and I, I drove across the, the uh, you know, the English Strait there. Sorry, the English Channel. And I landed at Calais, and where Calais is, Calais, France, that's where the biggest of the migrant camps in all of Europe were. Calais, France, and it was called the Jungle. And there were over, well, there was approximately 10,000 people there, give or take. And so I went into the camp, and the first thing I found was that all the workers there, who were all young, white, uh, college to grad school aged people, uh, they were not happy about my presence there at all. And I didn't know why. I'm like, no, 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 I'm here to help. I'm here to help. Like these people need help. They need representation. They need money. They need support. Like, come, let me get this. You guys come and sit down with me. There was this, like one of the main ladies in charge there. I was like, come and sit down and tell these people story. I'm going to put it on a podcast. I went and I spent some money and I, I bought this uh, platform in which I can put podcasts up and we can tell these people stories. And she says, she just, like when I offered that to her, her face, cr cr you know, crinkled up and, and, and she spit out these words. No, I will not come and do a podcast with you. And I was like, Oh, oh, okay, 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 you don't have to, like, stage fright, I get it, all right. Like, I dropped it immediately. But I still thought to myself, like, like you know, okay, like, maybe you have insecurities about talking, and, or, or maybe you think this is live or something, and you might screw up, and, but the level of fear and anger that she exhibited was completely inappropriate for what I was offering. I wasn't saying, like, you have to, you know what I mean? It was weird. And the more I talked to those workers there, uh, at the at the sort of base camp of uh, the jungle, as they called it, the more I was met with with just this weird wall of like, no, we don't want to talk to you. We do not appreciate your presence. No, you cannot go into the jungle and film or record or anything. And I was like, what are you? Okay, number one, I'm an American, and I have God given rights that I am that have been drilled into my brain, like there is no option other than this for me. I am free to do whatever the hell I want because I'm an American and God gave me these rights. How dare you, how dare you talk to me like that? And when I went into the jungle, I, un I then understood why these people were so reluctant and so bothered and insulted by my presence as I went into that, that camp and there were 10,000 Africans. There wasn't a Syrian to be found. There were no doctors, there were no engineers, there were no families, there were no children. These were militant aged African men with nothing to offer, right? These were not doctors, engineers, skilled laborers, these were people that were, that were trying, that were breaking the laws regarding refugees, right? Because here's the thing, uh, when it comes to the laws of refugees, when they made those laws, whatever, 70 years ago or so, they said, look, if you are a refugee, you know, if you're seeking asylum, if you're a refugee, whatever, then you have to, you have to make your claim in the very first country that your foot sets upon. So if you're from Syria, or if you're from Ethiopia, or Eritrea, or Somalia, or whatever, then when you land in Italy, you have to apply for asylum in Italy. 
You have to make your refugee status known in Italy or Greece or Spain, wherever it is that you land, that is the law. And it's even written right in there why that law is there. It's, it's for the express purpose that people cannot go benefit shopping. So there's all these people from Africa, Africa that landed in Italy, traveled all the way across Europe, you know, crossing four or five different countries. And they still refuse to, to uh, make their asylum claim until they get into England. And that's why they were all there at Calais. These people were benefit shopping, which is another violation of those laws that we have about refugees. And I told those people, I said, look, number one, I'm going to report this. I'm going to tell, I'm going to tell as many people as, that will listen what I've seen here and that you are indeed complicit in this. And then I told them, I said, look, right now what you're doing is you are telling the whole world on your social media platforms and your Facebook and your Twitter and your Instagram, you're telling all these people that you're down here doing God's work for these helpless, poor people and that they need to send you money to help with these poor people. And in the Christian world, we have a, a sense of duty when it comes to that. It's called compassion. And it's wildly encouraged in our holy scriptures. We must be compassionate. If we want to communicate with our God, compassion is one of the tools that we do, that we use to communicate with our God. And so when we see poor people or disenfranchised people, we want to give because it, it, it does something for our soul, and we understand that. I was telling these people, like, one day, and it won't be long, you are going to be found out. People are going to see what you're doing here. And then they're going to know that you lied to them and that these people are not refugees. They're not migrants. And when you burn their compassion... When you take their compassion and make it something that they themselves need to be ashamed of because they got duped by you, you're going to make the world a worse place because those people who gave you money, they're going to be less interested. They're going to be less uh, apt to express their compassion in the future because that... In the future, when, they, when they're given an opportunity to express compassion, they're going to be wildly skeptical, right? And, and, and most likely, unfairly skeptical. They're not going to be free to just give because they're going to be thinking like, oh, those kids down there in Calais, they robbed me. They lied to me. They, t they, they, they told me that I had a... Uh, a human rights obligation to send my money to these people, to take care of these poor disenfranchised people. And then it turns out that these are not poor disenfranchised people. These are criminals who are looking to get over on the system. They're criminals because we have laws about refugees and they broke every single one of them. And on top of that, they're not refugees. They're economic migrants. They're looking to get into England because England has the fattest welfare program. It's the same way with Australia. It's the same way with Germany. There's a reason why these migrants don't want to go to Italy or Greece or Romania or the Soviet Union. I'm sorry, I don't even know, it was Russia. Sorry, they're not called the Soviet Union anymore. But what I wanted to talk about to, to highlight this is that, listen, as we're looking around at the whole world going crazy, right, this week we've been talking about Angela Merkel is, is about to form a European Union military. That's not going to end well, people. That will, that will end in war. Again. Again. Germany has now conquered Europe for the third time. That's what the EU is. It's a German-headed rule of Europe. Congratulations, Germany. You got the hat trick. You got the third one. You conquered Europe again. And now they're going to militarize. Ugh. 
How, how long? <laughs> oh man, right? Was that scripture? You know, how long, oh man, will you will you continue to not listen? How long? But we, you know, we talked about that, and that's one thing that we can look at and say, okay, yeah, that's that's weird. We need to keep our eye on that. We need to chronicle that. We need to make sure that we write down, like, hey, Germany, when when it was still, you know, on on Friday, November sixteenth of two thousand eighteen, when it was still peacetime, and you know, we weren't at war with Europe. We need to write down, like. Well, this was what happened before we went to war. Germany took over Europe again, and then they militarized, and then they started talking about we need to protect ourselves from the United States. We need to write all that stuff down so that future generations can look back and see the deception. They can see the progression of it so that they don't make the same mistake again. Just like the first time, it, or, or the second time it happened, rather, when, when Adolf Hitler was, was rising to power and Time Magazine called him the man of the year. And the, and the royal crown of England was totally on board with Adolf Hitler. You have to remember that's a thing that happened. That there was a time when not only was, was you know, the, the Third Reich rising, but there was peace about it. There was peace in Europe about it. There was peace in England about it. And there was peace in the United States about it. And Time Magazine said, this guy, he's the man of the year. Remember that. We need to be able to look back on those times to say, well, maybe we can learn something about Germany, about the human condition, about what it is that we're capable of falling for, because it wasn't that long ago. It was the 1930s at 70, 89. That's 90 years ago, right? There are people alive right now that were alive back then. It wasn't that long ago. And the reason we need to chronicle what's happening right now, both in, in, in the real world and the spiritual world is, be, you know, just like D, I keep referencing D, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was in Germany and he was chronicling what was happening spiritually. And we can go back and read his words and be like, whoa, that has some real pragmatic, you know, practical applications to, the, you know, the, the reality of the situation. And that's what I'm saying. You have to chronicle these times. You have to look at what Angela Merkel is doing and see what it will see what's happening practically, right? There is the European Union of which Germany is the head. And then there's Germany, which is a nation of which Angela Merkel is the head. And when Angela Merkel speaks, she speaks on behalf of the European Union. When she says we need to militarize, that's that that's that's that is something that is happening in the practical real world but there's a spiritual side to it as well and we can take that and uh, you know uh, be pragmatic about it. it's like well why would you want to do that what's in your heart why do you want to do that right how, how many different ways can this possibly go wrong how many different ways can it go right <laughs> it, it, uh, 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 when it comes to the law of unintended consequences, well, what are the unintended consequences that, that can possibly happen? And when we see, we look around and we see three states just after the election that they're just doing recount after, they're just doing all these recounts until they win. You need to take note of that because that's happening in the, in the real world. Like that's actually, you can go down to Broward County or you can go down to Georgia or you can go down to Arizona and you can see people doing these horrible things but there's a spiritual side to it as well it's like well why are you doing that why is your thirst for power so unquenchable that you're willing to torch our entire system and the will of the people in order to get your way that's a spiritual problem and it's and it's working itself out in in the real world that's the pragmatic approach to it do you understand that there was, a, there was a man in Maryland over the last weekend that got shot in his own home for not giving up his gun. He was in his house. He wasn't bothering anybody. And he was shot because he wouldn't let the police come in and confiscate his guns. Who was this man? What were the charges? How many people verified that this, was, that, that this man was a danger? Because what it looks like is that one person called the cops and said, this guy's a bad guy. Maybe it was a... Uh, an ex-wife, right? 
Maybe it was a, maybe he had somebody under him at his place of employment that he had to fire. Maybe it was a disgruntled employee. We don't know. All we know is that the Second Amendment and the Fourth Amendment have been horrifically violated. And a man died. Take note of that. Take note and watch the progression. Because the more these people escalate, the closer we get to war. The closer we get to the place where you are going to have to defend yourself. Because let me tell you something. If you go back through history, recent, recent history, like Venezuela, for example, or Nazi Germany, or any place that, that was disarmed, Mao's China, even here in Albania, right, where I'm at. There are, there are horrific stories of torture. Horrific. The unimaginable uh, things that, that man is capable of doing once they're given free reign. The raping and the torturing and, and, just, and, and just bizarre, like sociopathic type torturing that goes on. You know what causes that? You know what allows that to happen? People that aren't prepared to defend themselves. People who aren't prepared to strike back. Disarmed people. Now we've got people in the federal government that are talking about repealing the Second Amendment. I'm telling you. you like, I've told you guys this. I tell you guys this almost every day. It's just going to keep escalating. It's just going to keep escalating. Uh, and, and we have to decide, we have to start deciding now, like not decide today, but like we need to start formulating like, okay, well, when, where is the cliff's edge? Where's the line where we're going, where we're going to say enough? Enough. Now, like you're, you, it, it has become apparent to me that you are trying to disarm me and therefore you are trying to kill me. You're trying to make me and my family and my children vulnerable to predators like you. And here's the line, and if you push me up against it, if you put my heels up against that line, at that point is when I will strike. Where is that line going to be? And we have to decide on that as a people, because, you know, because one man does it, that's a vigilante. A, a, a community of people do it, that's militia. Right? That's militia. That's what the Second Amendment starts off with. It start, starts off with. It doesn't start off with the right to bear arms. It starts off with a well-regulated militia, right? That's the first line of the Second Amendment. It's like, you can't, don't be a vigilante. You have to come together because there's wisdom and there's safety in that, right? You start talking, you know, you, you start thinking like, oh, I'm gonna, like Timothy McVeigh, he went and he bombed the IRS. It's like, dude, was there nobody in that guy's life to pull him aside and be like, oh, hey, 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 brother. Uh, we don't like the IRS either, but come on, you're talking about murdering innocent people. That's why you have to have a large group of people around you because you get, you get the old men and the old women in there and then you get the youngsters who just want to go into battle and start, you know, shedding blood and whatever. But it's like, it's, you need the elders there to, 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 to talk you through like, now hold on a second here. Let's actually read the Constitution and find out what it actually says and what it actually means and what other judges have said that it means. And let's, let's come to an agreement and let's come to this peaceably and reasonably. If we're going to defend ourselves, we, we're going to have to do it with a sound mind. That's why you have to be in community. And that community has to be balanced. It can't, you, your community cannot be just a bunch of you know, 21-year-old dudes. You can't be in a community where, where the, the, the entire sen, you know, consensus is going to be, well, I want to fight and I want to F. You know, it's like, no, I mean, that's, that's fine. Like, that's the phase of life that you're in, but this is why we need old people. And not just any old people, but wise old people. People that have seen some stuff. You need everybody. And I kind of went way off in a tear there, because what I... The reason I started off with the migrant crisis thing and President uh, Obama talking about Oh, these are these are refugees. Is that there's 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 another thing that's that's nefarious that's happening in the United States, which is that that abuse of people's compassion. When President Obama talks about 
uh, oh, these are these people are refugees. The, the problem with that is that there's a lot of people out there that are going to be like, oh, I need to express compassion. I need to get on the side of the Democrats on this one because obviously compassion is the right thing to do, which it is. Compassion is always right, you know. Um, but just following blindly and just listening to what other people say and say, well, I, I guess since President Obama calls them refugees and they must be refugees, that's not compassion. That's being a bleeding heart, and that's different. And one of the, one of the indicators of this, there was, uh, th this is kind of what I wanted to get to, was um, you guys may have heard there was, months ago there was this couple, young couple, young good-looking couple, and they went on GoFundMe and they told this, this heartbreaking story that they were on the highway and they got, you know, they ran out of gas and they made it to the off ramp and they, you know, came down the highway. And this homeless guy, this, this uh, uh, veteran of war, evidently, was living under the bridge and he came out from his hovel from underneath the bridge and he came down and he saw that this young, good looking couple had run out of gas. And he had $20 on him and he just said, look, here's, here's $20 because evidently these, this young, apparently educated couple didn't have any credit cards or any cash or anything on them and this homeless man had to come to their aid. And they went to GoFundMe and they said, listen, let's raise some money for this guy. How about $10,000? We can raise $10,000. We'll give it to this guy and maybe he can you know, go rent himself an apartment, get off the streets. And the whole the whole... Like, it, it spread like wildfire. It, it got all this social media attention because everybody was like, oh, no. This guy's a veteran? Oh, this guy's, you know, there's pictures of him. He's, he's, he's in shape. He's skinny. You know, he's got a beard. And they all in America looked at him and they said, oh, no. We need to help this guy. My, Christ, my Christian nature tells me I need to help this guy. I need to do this. It is my moral obligation. Now, Americans, and, and this, isn't, this isn't up for debate, by the way. Americans are by far, like by a country mile, the most generous people on the planet. Nobody gives more money away than Americans. By a long shot. That's just, that's... There's statistics, there's all kinds of facts to back that claim up, and I'm not going to get into it now, but Americans came to this man's defense. Four, it's like $400,000 was raised. They asked for $10,000, they got $400,000. That's the power of compassion. And that is what is good and right. That is... A representation that the people of the United States, they look at that and they hear the words of Jesus Christ saying that the, you know, the, the first and most important law is love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your might, with all of your soul. And the second is likened to the first that you must love your neighbor as yourself. And in all of this is, is all of the law and the prophets. Everything is in those two. That's what we hear when we see this, this poor homeless veteran. We hear the words of our master, the Lord Jesus Christ, saying, and the second is likened to the first. It is as important that you take care of this homeless veteran as it is that you tend to your relationship with the Almighty God himself. That the, that the two are entwined and inseparable and therefore the same. $400,000 was raised. In excess of four hundred. It was over 400000 Now we find out. Not long after that money was raised. Um, here, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just read some of this to you. Last year, the seemingly heartwarming tale of a homeless good Samaritan who helped a woman driver in need sparked a crowdfunding campaign that raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for him. Now the story has ended up in court and appears to have been a scam. Three people were charged in a New Jersey courtroom on Thursday in connection with an allegedly fraudulent scheme which allowed them to raise more than $400,000 on the Go GoFundMe site. November of 2017, Caitlin McClure and her boyfriend Mark D'Amico 
launched a crowdfunding page don't, uh, asking for donors to pay it forward. Remember that movie with uh, Rapey McRaperson, uh, Kevin Spacey, and Jay Moore? Pay it forward to a homeless military veteran, Johnny Bobbitt Jr. The couple said Bobbitt had given McClure his last $20 to buy gas for her car when he found her stuck along a hide- highway outside of Philadelphia. And they wanted to return this act of kindness. So Philadelphia in November, I would imagine that would have been pretty cold that night. The GoFundMe page announced the goal of $10,000 to help Bobbitt rent an apartment, buy a used car, and get back on his feet, but it quickly made the amount many times over. The story made headlines, and thousands donated to what seemed to be a good cause. But the first twist came in August, so this would have been, you know, whatever, August, September, October, three months ago. When Bobbitt, the homeless guy, sued McClure and D'Amico, saying that he had only received a fraction of the money, about 75 grand, and accused the couple of pulling one over on the donors. All right, so right there we're like, oh no, oh no, please. Please, I was, I was honoring my Lord. I was, I was doing my Christian thing. Please, please, don't tell me this. Bob had claimed the couple had gone on fancy vacations and bought themselves a BMW, which was seized at the couple's home in September. So the fact that, you know, just a little break away from the story, the fact that, that a BMW was seized in September tells you that, in fact, a BMW was purchased. Ultimately, the investigation reeled a second twist. Bobbitt, the homeless man, was in cahoots with the couple all along. The entire campaign was pre- uh, predicated on a lie, Burlington County Prosecutor Scott Coffina told the press conference Thursday. Quote, less than a half an hour after the GoFundMe campaign went live, McClure, in a text exchange, McClure is the boyfriend, No, I'm sorry, McClure uh, was the girlfriend. McClure, in a text exchange with a friend, stated that the whole story about Bob and assisting her was completely made up, he said, the the sheriff said. She did not run out of gas on I-95 off-ramp, and he did not spend his last $20 to help her, the prosecutor added. D'Amico, the boyfriend, McClure, the girlfriend, and Bobbitt, the homeless guy, conspired to fabricate and promote a feel-good story that would compel donors to contribute to their cause, end quote. The three were charged with theft by deception. Now, uh, I'm not going to go any further than that. Well, I'll tell you, let me finish this. Three, the three were charged with theft by deception and conspiracy to commit such a theft. A spokesman for the prosecutor's office said that they would be seeking jail sentences of some length, end quote. Now, One thing I want to point out in this is that theft by deception is against the law. Lying in order to steal is against the law. Thou shalt not lie. That's actually, in America, it is against the law to lie. You can lie to your parents, you can lie to your friends, but when you lie to a large swath of people, now you get into established law territory and theft by deception is against the law. Where does that come from? Where does that come from? There are cultures where it's not against the, against the law to lie. In fact, it's encouraged. I could, I could go on. There was, um, in the 1990s, there was a, what was called the Asian contagion. And that's where uh, the Japanese yen had been in the tank for a long time. And it was, you know, J- Japan was the second largest economy in the world and it was failing. And it, it, it caused a lot of problems and it put a lot of pressure on the U.S. dollar and a lot of other nations. And when it was found out, like how this happened, how is it the second largest economy in the world, one of the most productive people in the world... One of the most hardworking people in the world. How did this happen to their economy? And as it turned out, it was because they had built into their culture what was called keeping three sets of books, right? Your accounting. You've got one set of books for you so that you know what the truth is. Then you have another set of books, uh, you know, for your accountant. And then you have another set of books for the society, like the SEC, if it was in America or whoever. 
three sets of books, and all three of them are different, and only you have the right one. Only you know what the truth is. That's what crippled the Japanese economy, was lying. Like, if you're failing, just, just admit it. You know what I mean? If you're doing bad, just admit it. Get it over with. Tear that Band-Aid off with all the hairs and everything else that goes along with it and the dead skin and all that. So just, just tear that Band-Aid off. Don't lie. There's a reason why God says, thou shalt not lie. It's not, it, and it's not just because it's bad for everybody. It's because it's bad for you. And everything, any command that you see in the Bible, there's the Ten Commandments, there's the 613 points of the law, there's, there's you know, um, this is my commandment, um, that you love one another, that your joy may be full, there, you know what I mean? And there's all these other little sort of commandments that, that, are, that are particular, like when God says to King David, you know, be still and know that I am God. That's a commandment. Right. There's all these little commandments that you have to understand. Like you, The way that you have to approach each, each one of those is that every single one of those is an expression of God's love and protection over you. Every single one of them has to be interpreted that way first. That this is a method of God trying to protect you and enhance your relationship with him. And then it gets into more broader you know, social... You know, like the, the, the law about washing your hands. Well, it's obviously to keep you from getting sick. Because if you get sick, then you're going to make other people around you sick. And now it's a sociological problem. But it, it, it ultimately goes to like, God doesn't want you to be sick. So wash your hands before you eat. You understand what I'm saying? When these people, they go on GoFundMe and they, and they invoke these things like homeless like veteran, like homeless veteran living under a bridge, like this guy gave us his last $20, like those sorts of things. And they go on this campaign and it goes nationwide and then there's $400,000 raised. Every single person that gave money to them is seeing what's happening right now. And each one of those people from this day forward will be less likely to give uh, in, a, in an emergency circumstance, like, like if there is an actual homeless veteran who actually does give his last 20 bucks to some person who's out of gas, guess what? Guess what? That guy's screwed. There's not going to be any GoFundMe campaign for that guy because of these assholes. And I've said this a million times before, assholes rule, they ruin everything. Everything that's bad in the world is because of assholes. And here's these two young assholes who have now burned the compassion of tens of thousands of people. That's tens of thousands of people who are now going to have to, you know, if they're ever going to be restored to their compassion themselves, they're going to have to go through a wild spiritual journey to get back to where they were. Because from now on, they're just going to be like, screw you, you're a liar. Oh, you're sitting on an off-ramp with a flying a sign that says, oh, please give me some money, I'm broke, or whatever. It's like, from now on, those people are going to be like, liar. Liar. I've been lied to before. Never going to happen again. This is exactly what I was talking about when I, when I went to Calais. And I went to the jungle. I was like, listen, you people, I, you're not seeing the big picture here. You will be found out. That's how these things work. You might be able to lie to your girlfriend or your boyfriend. You might be able to lie to your employer or whatever and get away with it. But you, cannot lie, you can't lie to large swaths of people and get away with it. It doesn't work that way. It never works that way. You will always be found out, particularly in the age of social media. This, this dumb girl, this asshole girl, as soon as the GoFundMe goes live, she, she tweets to her friend or she sends a message to her friend and says, ah, it's all a big lie. It's like, you don't think that's going to come back on you, you dummy? And now you want to see you want to see exactly what I'm talking about? Go get $900 or $700 and you go buy yourself a plane ticket. You go fly to Calais. Count how many people that are in the jungle now. It ain't 10,000. Because those, the, the, the people of Europe and the people of the world finally got to see, it was put in their face by people like me, by people like Peter, Peter, Swi uh, uh, Peter Sweden, and 
Uh, what's that girl that went over there? There's a couple different girls that went over there. There was a number of people that went over there to expose what was actually happening. That there were non-government organizations that were paying for ships to go over to Libya or wherever and cram boatloads full of you know, young mili military-aged African men and ship them over to Italy. And it was all caught on tape. And so everybody that was feeling compassion for these, these refugees, they saw, oh, wait a minute, all this money that I've given, all this treasure that I've given, all this, you know, spiritual angst and, and, and the frustration in my spirit that I felt, it was all for nothing. I was being lied to. So the next time there is an actual war like there was in Syria and people are actually fleeing to save their actual lives and they come knocking on the door of Europe. They come knocking on the door of the Christian people. The Christian people are going to be like, eh, I don't know. Are you lying to me? Do you see what I'm saying? And now... From now on, because of guys like Barack Obama, they're saying, look at these refugees. It's like, dude, they're not refugees, and you will be found out. People do see it. People do eventually come to their senses. Sometimes it's because of people like me who just get so frustrated. They're like, okay, I'm going to have to go see what's actually going on here because I'm hearing this from Fox News, and I'm hearing this from CNN. I'm hearing this from President Obama, and I'm hearing this from President Trump. I don't know what the truth is. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to fill my tank, and I'm going to drive down to Mexico, and I'm going to look at these people, and I'm going to see what's going on. They will go find the truth, and it will be exposed. And the, the reason why we don't mince words, and we don't, we, we don't use words, and we don't, we don't draw on people's sense of compassion is because it damages everything. When you burn people's spiritual treasures, like compassion, like you know the need to be compassionate, the need, the need for justice, and the need for um, gratefulness and thankfulness, and like all of these spiritual things that we have in us, discipline and it just all the all the things that that make us human. When those things are burned, it ruins. It, it leaves a, a wake of disaster and that's what these people that's what these these two young assholes did they just made it so that everybody listening to this podcast and everybody who's read these stories online about these two assholes everybody that saw which is millions by the way it's millions of people that have seen this story every single one of those people including me including me from now on, like when I'm presented with an opportunity to express compassion, I'm going to be like, ooh, oh boy, I don't know. And now I'm going to have to pray my way through this. You know what I mean? Like this is going to, this, this now is something that I'm going to have to incorporate into my own prayer life and, and sort it out because it's like, man, how do I know? I'm certainly not going to stop being compassionate, but how will I know? What do I do? There's so many people out there that are just willing to lie for money. And keep in mind too, it's like number one, $400,000. What is that gonna buy you, a house? Maybe, you, maybe you'll be able to buy a house and that's it. Like, I mean, yeah, it would, it would change your life, but not like, not forever. Won't change your life forever. You buy that house, you're still gonna have to pay, you know, property tax and pay your water bill and garbage and all that. It's, it's like it's like four hundred thousand dollars in the in the bigger picture. It's not a lot of money, and you just sold your soul for that. And jokes on you. You don't get to keep any of it, right? So you went through this whole thing. You you were willing to lie to the American people, and now you don't get to keep any of the money. And for the rest of your life, your name will be attached to this. Nobody's ever going to accept you. I mean, these people would have to go join a monastery and be there for 10 years and then come back out and be like, listen, I paid my penance, all right? I really effed up there. I was greedy. I was whatever. I'm very sorry. Sorry about that, but now I'm a monk. I shave my head and I wear a robe. Uh, are we good? You know what I mean? Like, short of that, it's like you, these people will never be, never be accepted back 
in Christian society. I don't care if their employers are Christian or atheists or not. Like these people, like like the Christianity is built into our way of life, and their employers, probably atheists. I mean, a lot of people are these days. Their employers are going to be like, "Wow, you really, you really screwed up the old Christian spirit there." I'm afraid we can't employ you anymore. You know what I mean? Like these people's lives are ruined. Over four hundred grand. Right? <laughs> it's like that uh, that KRS One song. It starts off. So you want to be the million dollar man, get with your plan, make a deal with the devil, settle for a hundred grand. That's what it is. It's like these people, like, oh, they, they just want $10,000. Oh, I bet we could make $10,000. Holy crap, we got $400,000. Woohoo, let's go to Vegas and buy a BMW. Yay! Oh no, we're being charged with a crime. All the money's being taken away from us. They came and picked up the BMW out of our front yard. And from now on, we're never going to be able to, to get a job. Guarantee these people are, are, are going to be lifelong Democrats now. These people are going to be out there blaming Republicans for all the, just like, you know, just all, like all the Hollywood rape victims that were raped by Harvey Weinstein. This is one thing I don't understand. What's her name and Alyssa Milano and the other what's her name? It's like they all it's like they they wanted to be a star so bad that they had sex with a filthy, disgusting pig, Harvey Weinstein. And then in their anger, they decided they were going to blame all conservatives. I don't understand what like I don't understand that. Like, don't you see like Harvey Weinstein is a liberal? He's one of you. Maybe you should get away from liberal men. Like, I don't get it. Anyways, I don't, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. Take note of what's happening. Ladies and gentlemen, take notes. Just take notes. Like, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to act. Don't go killing anybody. You know what I mean? But get together with your community and decide. You know what I mean? And talk about these things and make sure that you understand. Like, when you see stories like this and when you hear Barack Obama talking about refugees... You hear about the refugee crisis in Europe and all these things. Make sure that you, you talk amongst your friends so that you can come to your equilibrium. It's like, where do I stand on all these things? Do I just give up expressing compassion for the rest of my life? I'm telling you, if you do that, it's a big mistake. Your sense of compassion, your ability to be compassionate, your ability to uh, love your neighbor, not the whole world, Jesus told you to love your neighbor. Who is your neighbor? Wow, well, maybe you should look up the def definition of neighbor. I hear a lot of Christians dispute, well, who's my neighbor? Who's, you know, Jesus said love my neighbor. Who's your neighbor? It's the guy next door. That's who it is. Well, I mean, wouldn't in the interconnected, you know, global society. No, it's whoever lives next door to you. That's your neighbor. That's, that's who your neighbor is. It's your next door neighbor. That's what the word neighbor means. Whoever lives in your neighborhood, that's your neighbor. That's your neighbor. Or do they live in your neighborhood? No, then they're not your neighbor. Simple. Simple. Jesus was not like some sort of weird wizard who like was trying to trick people with his words. Neighbor means neighbor. It means the same thing in, in the context that he said it as you use it when you use it. Your neighbor. Your neighbor. Not your neighbor's neighbor. Your neighbor. Be compassionate. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your God and love your neighbor. Define who is your neighbor. Define what compassion is and have it well defined in your mind so that you don't lose these gems that God has given us to, to, to better facilitate us communicating with him. When you see stories like this and you see Barack Obama and you see the Democrats raping our ballot system, like when you see these things, it's like don't lose. Don't lose what's good. Don't lose justice or compassion or diligence or virtue or purity or these sorts of things like don't lose those things those are for you they're for you and God is for you and everything he does is an expression of his love for you that's it for today hey if you want to support the show I recommend being compassionate uh, <laughs> be generous go to archadvocate.com if you want to become a monthly patron you can do that Give a couple of bucks a month. It's up to you. I want to thank each and every one of you who already is a patron. 
Uh, if you want to give some dough on a one-time thing, that's cool too. You can do that on PayPal. The PayPal me link is right there. Leave a note and I'll read it on the air, thus making you famous in front of all your friends. We are still awaiting the arrival of young baby Caleb. Um, here's one thing. Uh, the first doctor that we ever talked to during this pregnancy, like within weeks of when we found out she was pregnant, said that the, the, the due date was November 18th. But then we talked to like a couple other doctors and they said, no, it's more like October 30th or something like that. So I think we are back to just believing the original doctor, even though it was less likely, you know what I mean? Because it, it, it would seem that it would be harder to figure out the due date based on an earlier prediction. But turns out it looks like that guy was right. Today's November 16th and we're still waiting for baby Ryland to come into the world. Uh, so hopefully on Monday I'll be able to give you guys some news. And I'll be able to show you pictures and everything. But baby Ryland... Still in the womb, chilling, uh, doing his little dance in there every day. Thank you guys for joining the show today. Please hit subscribe, especially if you're if you've never hit subscribe before. Please hit subscribe. All right, helps me out and do so on the YouTube uh, channel if that's what you're doing as well. God bless you guys. Have a good weekend. We'll talk to you on Monday.